Okay, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the uh, webinar here, Kinetics Noise Control. My name is Lee Chinenshin. I am the Director of Sales for the uh, HVAC market. Uh, we cover vibration isolation, seismic, and wind restraint uh, for my department at Kinetics. Um, and we appreciate everyone taking the time out of their day today to uh, uh, look at this webinar, listen along. Uh, please, if you have any questions, uh, write them in the uh, questions area or the chat area. And then uh, after the webinar is done today, I will reach out to everyone. Uh, also on the last slide, which we'll leave up for a few minutes, uh, my email is listed on there, so please uh, also feel free to reach out to me directly if you have uh, any questions. So uh, as far as uh, today's webinar, we're going to be talking about the uh, selection of vibration isolation uh, and a little bit about roof curb noise control uh, and the importance of that. So let's start out here with the basics. Vibration is the unwanted motion uh, that is transmitted to the building structure and the occupants, generally from rotating HVAC equipment. So as human beings, uh, we're kind of feeling this buzz, we're feeling that vibration, and our brain is turning that vibration and it's turning it into like a buzzing noise so we actually hear it. And not only is it important to uh, you know, make a quiet space for the occupants of the building, but of course, with modern construction using lighter and lighter materials and steel structure, um, those vibrations can actually get into the structural members of the building. Uh, and there have been cases where they were able to um, document the, the, the damage caused by vibration, excessive vibration, getting into the building structure itself. Uh, the columns can harmonize and over time it can actually degrade the structure of the building. So yes, it's important to us human beings within the space that we don't feel or hear this vibration noise, but it is also good for the longevity of our building itself to make sure that we're eliminating those vibrations. So um, how do we get rid of that? How do we mitigate that vibration? We've got these uh, big pieces of equipment, they have rotating masses, so we resiliently decouple the equipment from the building structure using vibration isolators. So in other words, what you want to do is uh, get something between the equipment itself and the structure to decouple it. So there is science behind it. Uh, isolation, the performance of it, is a function of the system's natural frequency. And this depends on the driving frequency, uh, the RPM, the, the mass, the weight of, of what we're isolating, and the stiffness of the isolators below the equipment. Uh, for that reason, almost all vibration isolation specifications define the required isolation by the static deflection of the isolators. So uh, we're talking about how much the isolators squish under the equipment. And this is, of course, under the dead load. So this is when you have the full weight of the equipment in its operating weight. So if it's a cooling tower, it's filled up. Uh, if it's a chiller, it's, it's got water running through it. So it's now at its operating weight. So how much will our isolators deflect squish under that absolute dead load weight? So why are there so many types of isolators and which type do I really need for my equipment? As I said, it, it's not really black magic. There is science behind it uh, and you can do mathematical equations to figure out natural frequency and deflection. Fortunately for, uh, for us, we have cheat sheets. There's a really good set of uh, charts that are provided by the ASHRAE handbook. So, here at Kinetics, we offer a vibration isolation selection guide. Uh, if you go to the website as highlighted here, uh, and you click on uh, you click on downloads uh, and under product literature, you can actually download the vibration isolation selection guide and keep it as a, a PDF, uh, as it were, right on your desktop. Uh, with our selection guide, we essentially took the charts from the ASHRAE handbook and then we listed them by each specific piece of equipment. So uh, here's a, an example 
uh, for the page that deals with chillas. So here's a nice picture of a chiller. Uh, and then here's the chart right here from the ASHRAE handbook. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how that works. So essentially, uh, and I'll zoom in on the one here for cooling towers and boilers. So according to ASHRAE, cooling towers and boilers are on the same page, and that's because they tend to vibrate in, in a very similar similar way. Uh, so they're isolated in a similar fashion, even though one's hot and one's cold. So for, for the uh, example that I've highlighted here, uh, for slab on grade, in other words, if our cooling tower is out in an equipment yard, if it's, uh, if it's on uh, the ground level or in a basement or something like that, slab on grade, uh, it would need an ASHRAE type one isolator. Uh, and that would come with a quarter inch deflection. Uh, what that means to me is that means it's going to have some sort of pad under it, some sort of isolation pad, uh, which is going to give us a quarter inch deflection. Uh, and that's going to help in eliminate that vibration from that cooling tower. Now, the higher you go within the building, the wider the floor span will get. Uh, this is the distance between the structural support. So the wider the floor span, uh, typically what will happen is the floor itself will sag and deflect. So now we have a floor that's deflecting uh, and we need to add additional deflection to get to our natural frequency. So basically anything other than slab on, on grade for this particular cooling tower, we're going to a two and a half inch deflection type four I isolator. So uh, that's going to be basically almost a four inch deflection uh, spring isolator that's housed. And we'll look at what those will look like and what these ASHRAE types mean. But essentially, that's how the chart works. So uh, depending on where the equipment's going to live in the building within the space, uh, can, it can adversely affect how much deflection you need to put under that piece of equipment to properly eliminate the vibration. So let's look at these isolator types. So ASHRAE type one, that was the one uh, for cooling towers there where it showed like a quarter inch uh, deflection, right? So that is a pad. So you're essentially uh, have a neoprene uh, rubber pad or uh, you know kinetics. We do offer a fiberglass isolation pad. Of course, the advantage of fiberglass is uh, it is not affected by temperature, uh, um, you know, a rubber or neoprene in the middle of winter time is as hard as a hockey puck and isn't deflecting at all uh, as uh, uh, fiberglass will maintain the appropriate deflection. But an ASHRAE type one is simply pad. It's, a, it's the equipment sitting on the pad. There's no bolting down. You're just, just using the gravity of the equipment to sit it on some, some isolation pads. An ASHRAE type two, you now take the same elements, rubber, neoprene, fiberglass, and you put a way to control those materials. So this uh, that I'm highlighting here in the corner is a hanger. So essentially you would attach uh, the hanger to the, to the bottom of the, the deck uh, and then uh, off of all thread and a, and a nut and a washer here through the rubber puck, the neoprene element, you would suspend your equipment. So you're isolating suspended equipment uh, with a rubber or a neoprene uh, and fiberglass option hanger. Then, of course, you have your feet, feet uh, your floor mounted rubber neoprene. So now we have a way to bolt down or attach the equipment to uh, the pad, the, the, the fiberglass or rubber. In ASHRAE Type 3, we now introduce the spring into the mix. So now we're able to up our deflection. And it's really important to know that uh, all spring isolators have a, a rubber element in, in series uh, with the spring. So uh, here you have a spring and a, a rubber neoprene element, spring fiberglass element. The SH does not have one of those because it's for controlling movement and not necessarily ice, uh, isolating vibration. The reason we have a rubber and a spring is because uh, when equipment starts to operate, when equipment starts to ramp up to its operating uh, RPMs, 
it will typically uh, go through a curve, a ramp up period or a ramp down period. And we'll see different frequencies uh, coming from that equipment during that time. Uh, and the rubber element in series with the spring helps kind of eliminate all facets of the vibration coming from that particular equipment. ASHRAE Type 4, we now have a spring uh, and we have a way to house that spring. In other words, we've introduced uh, a snubbing element. Uh, and the reason we want to do that is because uh, in, in an earthquake zone, for example, uh, you have a hospital, maybe you have a, a diesel generator that could vibrate into the space. So we want to make sure that equipment, again, isn't vibrating into the space. So we want to float that equipment on springs. However, if an earthquake were to happen, we want to make sure that that equipment, as it's a diesel generator, is still operating uh, even during and after an earthquake. So we need to hold that equipment in place. So the, the technical part here is holding it in place, restraining it, um, for wind forces or seismic forces, uh, if it's on a roof and it's a fan, obviously it can't blow off or an air handling unit, but we also need to float it on the isolators to make sure it's properly um, isolated, decoupled from the structure. So one of the things is, is how to isolate the equipment yet allow it to be restrained. And, and that's one of the questions we get all the, to all the time. So the type four isolator shown here, has a snubbing element to it. So uh, you have, a, uh, on this particular example, you have a, a nice top plate. So you would set a frame or, or a piece of equipment to this top plate. And then either side, you have your spring. So uh, imagine the weight of the equipment pushing down on the plate at the top. Uh, the springs are now compressed uh, and deflected to the appropriate deflection. Uh, and the equipment is now free to uh, be decoupled. So there's nothing touching the structure other than the springs and the springs are absorbing the vibration. In this little cavity here in the middle, there is a, a metal block uh, covered in rubber, neoprene, uh, and that's the snubbing element. So uh, any movement a quarter inch in any direction uh, and this snubbing element is gonna be engaged within the housing. So of course, uh, during an earthquake or a high windstorm, that snubber may be actuated within the housing. But of course, nobody cares about vibration getting into the space in the middle of an earthquake. So uh, we are going to engage that snubbing element here and capture that equipment from being out of move. And by code, we uh, have to allow a quarter inch movement in all directions. So. Uh, after these uh, springs are properly adjusted, uh, these, uh, these snubbing element within here will be floating with a quarter inch clearance in, in all directions. Uh, and that's how we're able to capture uh, and restrain the equipment, yet allow it to float uh, on the springs or pad or whatever it may be. Uh, and that is, uh, of course, one of the challenges when you're isolating equipment, uh, yet restraining it as well. Also, the choice uh, of correct isolators. Here, uh, a fan manufacturer provided some nice spring isolators to go under their fans on the roof, but unfortunately, uh, these are not restrained springs. Uh, and therefore, the first windstorm that came along, uh, as you can see, the bottom half, the housings are all still here on the frame. Uh, and this fan did actually blow off of the isolator. So, it's important to make sure that uh, somebody uh, uh, is making the correct selections based on, again, the location of the equipment, not just because we wanna make sure we get the appropriate deflection so that we're operating correctly in eliminating that vibration, but also in cases where we need to understand where we need to use a restrained spring so we can capture it. If they had used something like this when the wind came the snubber would have engaged. Here, there is no snubber, so the equipment was free to blow right off of its uh, frame and the isolators that it's mounted to. So um, next up, we're gonna look at here, um, ASHRAE Type 5. So ASHRAE Type 5 is essentially a thrust restraint. So 
Um, all these do uh, is when you have a fan that's in line with some duct work, that fan, when it fires up, is going to want to pull itself away from the duct work, uh, rip itself out of place. So you would uh, install two of these either side of the fan, between the fan and the duct work, and they would act like a restraint type of suspension to allow that fan to kick on, uh, come up the operational speed and thrust without pulling itself away from its intended uh, piece of duct work. Ashtray Type 6, we don't see a lot of these, but these are airbag systems. Uh, why don't we see a lot of air springs? Well, they're, they're challenging. Um, for instance, um, a four inch deflection spring isolator is going to give you about 99.7% efficiency. Yet a spring, uh, air, an airbag system is going to give you 100% efficiency. So it is going to perform better at eliminating vibration. However, an airbag needs air. It gets that air from a compressor. That compressor now vibrates and makes noise uh, within the space. It also requires a leveling system, uh, a, a control system, as it were, to make sure the appropriate air is always in the right uh, location for the airbag. So it's an extremely expensive um, solution to eliminating vibration, and it comes with problems, and it causes uh, has a lot of maintenance to, to keep it running. However, if you are in a situation where you have an extremely sensitive space uh, and a lot of vibration above it, then something like this is going to work. Another uh, application, we see a lot of these air springs are when you have a multi-cell cooling tower and maybe certain cells of the cooling tower are gonna be drained certain seasons of the year. So the center of gravity of that piece of equipment is gonna adversely change uh, throughout the different seasons. Uh, and an airbag system would self-level itself below that equipment. Um, next up is base types. So um, according to ASHRAE, a base type A is essentially no base. We're going to mount the equipment directly to the isolator. So here's a great picture of the chiller, uh, and it's mounted directly to the top plate of an isolator here. So there is no base under there, just the equipment sitting uh, on the isolator. That is a base type A. Base type B is very commonly used. This is a structural beam or a structural frame that goes below the equipment. Typically, you would see something like this used uh, below a cooling tower. Uh, the way a cooling tower is manufactured, it's sheet metal. It does not do well when you try to point load it by putting isolators directly under it. It needs the weight distributed evenly across the isolator. So it needs uh, a steel frame or, or steel rails uh, uh, mounted below it uh, in, in order to distribute that weight out across the spring. Base type C, this is the uh, typical concrete inertia base. So this is a, a sheet metal form that's filled with concrete uh, and it adds an inertia mass to the bottom of the pump uh, that stops the pump or fan twisting and spinning as it fires up because there's a mass of inertia hanging off the bottom of it. We can then isolate that mass of, mass of inertia by putting springs under the pump base itself. So uh, here's a great example of a pump room where even the accessories for the pumps are are being housed right on top of the, the concrete inertia base, and, and that would be considered a, a base type C uh, per ash rate. Base type D, uh, this is something we're going to dig a little deeper on. Uh, we have a little bit of time left, uh, and this is a, an isolation curb. This is a spring curb uh, for below an air handling unit. So the challenge is with an air handling unit is that essentially, you are um, you are cutting two giant holes through the through the roof of the building into the space, uh, and those holes are for duct work to go through, uh, but also noise uh, and and vibration are going to easily transmit through those holes. So essentially, we have this 
uh, an air handling unit is a sheet metal drum skin, and it has a bunch of energy going through it. So this whole box of energy that's a sheet metal drum skin is now going to encapsulate itself over a, a rectangular box called a roof curb, and then it's going to have openings to within the space. Uh, and there is vibration from the inside of the fans uh, inside the unit. Uh, and we want to take care of that vibration. So vibration from fans and compressors uh, is, is something that we want to eliminate from the unit. Uh, vibration from the casing, uh, and that's radiated noise that's caused by duct turbulence. Uh, and the airborne noise of the fans and the compressors, that's source two. So source one and source two are vibration. Now, a lot of these air handling units do come with with springs already under the fans inside of that air handling unit. Uh, and if you are sitting that air handling unit on a regular curb, it is going to give you some isolation. However, the casing, all of the energy going through the sheet metal drum skin is not going to be eliminated by those simple springs. So that's when you need to go up to the next level set the air handling unit on a spring rail uh, and eliminate source one and two of vibration. Uh, and you must lock out the internal springs uh, on the air handling unit when you do that because uh, internal springs inside the air handling unit sitting on springs on a roof curb will actually potentially make the vibration worse. So number two here reads the ductible noise from supply and return air fans, that's source three. So you have uh, duct noise. We're now going to control that by putting silencer uh, on the supply fan side uh, and an acoustical plenum on the return air side. Uh, we'll minimize the pressure drop, but we can actually control the NC levels within the space uh, from the duct-borne noise. Uh, and then you have the breakout noise through the bottom of the unit. So uh, we would put some sort of acoustical floor treatment within the curb. And of course, depending on the space, depending on the sensitivity uh, below the air handling unit within the space, you may need all of the above. You may only need a small selection of these things. So our acoustical floor treatments, we do have a new product called the RT7. Uh, this is a layering of different kinetics products, uh, and the, it starts out with an SDC rating of 37. We offer it with an SDC rating of 47, 52, and 60. So again, depending on how noisy the air handling unit is, and depending on how sensitive the space is below, you can effectively um, you know, make sure that you are specifying the appropriate noise control paneling to go in the bottom of the roof curb. Um, what's uh, uh, what's uh, interesting about the RT7 is we did uh, actually reach out to a company called Inatech, and we did have independent testing done to verify the STC ratings. Uh, this was important for us at Kinetics. We stand by our products, uh, and we knew this was something that was going to be uh, widely used within the industry, and we wanted to verify the different layering of, of uh, kinetics products, noise control products we use uh, were going to give us the appropriate STC rating we wanted. So uh, this uh, uh, rendering here shows the STC 37. So this is a kinetics um, noise, noise panel uh, that would normally get wrapped in fabric. It's a, a layer of kinetics acoustical ceiling tile another net, another layer of the noise panel, and then another layer of the ceiling tile, and then one more layer uh, of, of the acoustical paneling. So uh, this one has um, you know, five layers of noise control levels, and that's the SDC rating of 37. And as we add more kinetics layer products in there, we can get to the higher SDC rating. So uh, this comes pre-cut, just lays in the curb. Um, we do offer, uh, also offer our noise block. This is our MicroPerf uh, sheet metal noise block barrier wall system. This can also go down in the in the bottom of the uh, roof curb as well. Uh, this was uh, the first product we used as a floor treatment, and then the RT7 has given us a lot more options. 
One other thing at Kinetics we do get into a lot now is uh, delegated design. Uh, obviously, that is a big buzzword in the industry right now. Uh, pipe stress analysis, uh, BIM coordination, this is something that Kinetics is starting to get uh, involved in and, and uh, we, we do offer pipe stress analysis, full riser designs, uh, and it is a buzzword in the industry. It's something that we're seeing more and more of uh, and we're seeing more and more requests. So Kinetics only used to really engineer anything we were going to manufacture ourselves. Uh, we are working uh, to get certifications for engineering in all the states so we can offer engineering services uh, to complement our products as well. Uh, so uh, BIM coordination for seismic projects, that kind of thing, pipe stress analysis, uh, we, can, we can take care of that. Uh, we do also do um, virtual stress testing. Uh, so we have uh, certified other people's equipment before. Um, we've done uh, stress testing uh, and offered like a certificate for that, that kind of stress testing. So uh, that rounds out today's webinar. Um, I do really appreciate everyone's time. Uh, There's an awful lot of you that attended today. So uh, it's great to see such a turnout. Um, you know, we're, we're out to travel and again, we're visiting folks in, in person, but it's good to see the, that the webinars are still getting a good a, a amount of attendance. Again, any questions you may have, please uh, put them down in the chat box and uh, we'll reach out to you um, individually. Uh, and my email is now on the screen for anyone that wants it. And uh, thank you very much and have a great day.